day sunshine could be seen on the other side of the wall. Anchel steer and not a cloud in sight. Here, there is a clouded sunset. Steady rain had just begun to fall, coming faster than the tints can be raised. Midwife is there. I'm going to skip a bunch. Um, and we see a woman. We see a baby at her side. The woman seemingly is dead. A baby at her side. And the man comes up, page two. His hand went up to brush the mark from his forehead, then suddenly stopped as a pale white hand gripped his, forced it down. The white hand released its grip. The speaker stepped into the ring of firelight. The others watch. The man walks towards the bodies, and what does he do? He looks at them, and then he looks at the people watching the bodies. He pushes his head back, and he says, I am called Abhorson. Now, if you're one of those nerdy people who looks up words, if you got onto Google and looked up Abhorson, it would give you the title of a book, it would tell you about the characters in the book, but if you looked up the definition, not there. All right? Why? Garth Nix invents the word. He said, and his words sent ripples through the people. In other words, within the context of the novel, they understand what the word means. And there will be a baptism tonight. Now, whether you are a quote-unquote practicing Christian or not, everybody is familiar with the word baptism if they live in the United States. Why? Because we are, quote, unquote, I would say, post-Christian country. And baptism is something, as an idea, it just kind of floats around in the ether. Okay? So, there's going to be a baptism. So that tells you somebody is either going to get dumped under water, or they're going to get water sprinkled on them, and it's a religious ceremony. That might be about the most one knows about it. The charter mage... Uh, what? Not the priest, not the bishop, not the pastor, not the minister, not the preacher, the charter mage. Looked down on the bundle in the midwife's hands and said, the child is dead, Abhorson. We're travelers. Our life lived under the sky. It's often harsh. We, we know death. That is no sense in baptizing this kid. This kid's dead. We know death, not as I do. What does he mean, not as I do? Assuming you've read a little bit more into the novel, or, like Logan, you've read a whole bunch of the novel, or you've read the other novels. He's been in death. He's been in death. Okay? He's gone on the other side. He's journeyed to Hamlet's the undiscovered country from whose born no one returns, and returned. It's one of the really cool things Garth Nix is doing in these books. Because death, as he will portray it, is not simply a doorway. It's not living here, dead here. Death is what? Nine doorways. Nine doorways. <laughs> or nine gates. Death, in other words... is a journey or a passage. A journey and passage have what? A beginning and an end. Between the beginning and the end, they have... Okay, we'll call it the middle row. So it's not just bam, and you're dead. Dead, dead, all the way dead, completely dead. In this novel, what you're going to see is you can be Princess Bradian, mostly dead, and come back. If you have a Miracle Max, a.k.a. Abhorson, to help bring you back. Okay. And I say the child is not yet dead. In other words, the child looks dead. Outward appearances. Okay. But what is he talking about? Exactly. The body appears dead, but the soul hasn't gotten all the way here. It's in this part of the process. Okay. 
The man tried to meet Ab Horson's gaze, faltered, looked away. Nobody moved, made any sign. And the woman says, so it is easily done. Sign the child, Aaron Hill. We'll make a new camp. In other words, the woman's kind of like, this old guy's crazy. Do what needs to be done, that is prepare the body. That's what the sign the child means. And so that we can get ready to go on. The charter mage, that's the Aaron Hill guy, inclines his head. That is, he's listening to her, so she's the leader of the group. And... The others back away, start packing up their camp. And they keep looking kind of at the Abhorson. When the midwife went to lay the child down and leave, Abhorson said, oh, stop, wait, you're going to be needed. She's a midwife. What does a midwife do? Brings a child from where? Womb to earth. It's the birthing process, right? Guess what? This is also a birthing process. The birthing is from Earth here to wherever this is. When you get to the end of the third book, not the prequel third book, that's the fourth book, get to the end of the third book and it's not clear what that final place is. Right? So, he says, you're going to be needed. The midwife looks down at the baby, sees it's a girl. You know, he could be sleeping. Why? Because dead people look like they're sleeping. And sleeping people look sometimes like they're dead. She had heard of Abhorson, and if the girl could live, so she picks up the child. Holds her out to the charter mage. If the charter does not, says the man, the charter mage, the Arendelle guy, Abhorson, let's see what the charter wills. So the charter has volition. The charter has agency. It can do something. So is the charter just another name for God? No, it's not. It's another name for something. I just haven't figured out what that something is yet. It's one of the things I love about these books. You can't pin them, you know, they're not like um, George McDonald's books where it's very clear, you know, something is God and something is Satan and, you know, everything in between. Not clear at all. Okay? So, uh, lost my page. The man looks at the child again, sighs, takes a small bottle from his pouch, holds it aloft, cries out a chant, that's the beginning of a charter, one that listed all things that lived or grew or once lived or would live again and the bonds that held them all together. So if he's chanting something and it's listing all these things, what is he chanting? What's it like? Can't say what it actually is. Well, no, he's not speaking another language. He's speaking in words they all understand because we're told it lists things that lived or grew, so they, they understand that. Okay? It's like a prayer. Okay? And it's listing what? Things that are or have been alive. Well, the child was or had been alive alive, unless it was stillborn, we're not told, then the chanter is silent. Notice, as he speaks, he's holding this bottle, and what happens to it? It fills with light. So, the words that he chants cause light to fill the bottle. Is he chanting, light fill the bottle, light fill the bottle, light fill the bottle? No. He's chanting in remove that. And the charter somehow starts putting light into the bottle. All right? There's a great flash. Now let me back up. He touches the bottle to the earth, takes the bottle, touches it to the earth, 
then to the sign of wood ash on his forehead. We don't know what the sign is. We don't know if it's this, if it's this, if it's this. It could be a check mark. It could be a dollar sign. It could be a smiley face. It's a, it's a sign. What does a sign always do? Points to something else. Okay? So, touches the bottle of the earth, touches the sign on his forehead, and then pours whatever's in it all over the child. A great flash in the woods, the glowing liquid splashes over the child's head, and the priest cries by the charter that binds all things, we name thee. Now, for a lot of Christians, you know, many don't practice the rite of baptism. Instead, they have christenings. What's a christening? It's where you name the child. doesn't mean it, you know, the kid doesn't have a name until that happens, because sometimes this doesn't happen until the kid's 8, 9, 10, 12 years old. Usually, it's when they're a few weeks, so you just call a baby, hello, baby. For the first, you know, and then finally a name pops into your mind. Stop. No. Okay. So this is a naming ceremony. We didn't read this. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, in the first volume of the Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, there's a scene where Uh, there's a scene where Frodo and his group meet Tom Bombadil. Okay? And they get rescued by Tom Bombadil and they go to his house. And one night after dinner and stuff, they're talking with Tom Bombadil. And Tom Bombadil kind of sings to them, tells them stuff he has experienced in Middle Earth. And he says things like, I was here before the big people came meaning us, humans, and elves. I was here before the elves went across the sea, that is, left Middle-earth, went off to Valinor, fell, and then came back to Middle-earth. And he says, I was here before the dark came from outside. Now, if you know your Tolkien cosmology, he's talking about, I was here on Arda before milk came from outside. Okay, so within Tolkien's cosmology, what does that mean? This is like our world now. He was on Earth before Satan came into Earth, or onto Earth. So he goes on and says, um, Frodo goes, who are you, Master? And he says, who am I? Eldest I am. Okay. Eldest. What does the est mean? Most. So most eld. Do you get beyond most old? Do you get most or oldestest? Not, be, not beyond eldest, you don't. Eldest means the absolute oldest. Well, later on, Treebird says, I'm the oldest. And then he's kind of like, oh, yeah, but I forgot about him. Why is all of this important? Because Tom Bombadil then asks Frodo a question. He turns the question around. Frodo says, who are you? And he says, tell me, who are you? Nameless, alone, yourself. Now think about that for, for just a moment. Nameless. Where do we get our names from? Parents. Parents. So how can you be nameless? Your parents abandon you? No. Your parents never name you? Okay, possibly. But that's weird. <laughs> Who are you, nameless, alone? Alone means nobody else. Yourself. 
Not what others call you, not what others think of you. Okay? Is there anyone slash anything ultimately nameless in the sense of not named by somebody else, alone, following what we talked about the other day in class, oneself. There's only one thing like that. God. Moses meets God on the Mount Sinai. What does God tell Moses to say to the other Hebrews when Moses goes, uh, they're not going to believe me. Who am I going to say sent me? Does he give them a big long list of names? Megan? I am that I am. What do you mean I am that I am? What does that mean? I am. I, what's am? I exist. The I exist sent me. It means the self-existent one. Nameless. Why? Nobody's behind God to go, God. Or Fred, you know, if that's just real Indian man. Tetragrammaton, you know, whatever. Nobody's there. He names himself. And what does he name himself? I be. That's what it is. I be. All of you, all of us, everything else, not be. Everything else, be dependent. D, we've talked about this before. Hanging from, out of D, out of, or from, pendant. Hanging. We all, everything, according to this idea, hangs from God. Why? Because God brought it all into existence. Okay? So, here we get a naming. They're going to give the child the name. Normally, the parents of the child would then speak the name, but now Abhorson speaks. Sabriel. Normally, the parents. Why? Because he is Sabriel's father. We come to find out. And as he uttered the word, the word, the wood ash disappeared from the priest's forehead. That is, the priest who put the sign on the child, okay, the sign that was on his forehead disappears and slowly takes shape on the child's. The charter had accepted the baptism. So whatever this is, notice, it can be placed. If it accepted it, it's been placated. It's accepted whatever the offering is. But, 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 she's dead. What tells him she's dead? No breath. No heartbeat. No pulse. Hmm. And he's like, is it really gone? And maybe there's a little bit left. Maybe this is a mistake. Slowly a mist begins to rise from Abhorson's body, spreading towards the man and the midwife, who do what? They get the hell away from there. They go to the other side of the fire, because this guy, very shortly, is encased in what? Frost. He could hear the child crying. That's good. He who? Abhorson. Why? Because she's somewhere in here. He hears the soul of the child crying. That means it's still alive. Right? Because dead people don't cry. So, he goes, he gets the body, he brings her back. Um, skipping a bunch of stuff. And we see page 7. He speaks with Caragor, who comes up in both this book and later books. Um, let's skip a bunch. Abhorson gets the child and comes back. Page 9. Frost cracks on the ground. Icicles hung from Abhorson's nose. He wipes them off. He asks the midwife, how is she? Very well. A little cold. Well, yeah. 
it chews in death, you know, it's going to be a little cold. So, the woman says, shall I take her to my house? I have need of a nurse, will you come? Uh, that person says, I will take her to my house, I need a nurse, will you come? She says, you, 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 you're a, there's one of those words, necromancer. Necro, death, mancer, sorcerer, magician, magic. Necromancy is actually one of those forms of magic that is mentioned in the Old Testament. That is said, don't do it. Notice, it's not mentioned in the Old Testament and said, what about your hooey? How stupid do you have to be to really think you can do magic? In the Old Testament, it's taken very seriously. Why? The king Saul does what? Goes to the witch of Endor, George Lucas, Empire Strikes Back, uh, no, Revenge of the Jedi. Yeah. Um, you know, the force of Endor, etc. Goes to the witch of Endor and has her do what? Call up the shade of Samuel, the prophet. Calling up the shade of that's necromancy. She's using magic to bring a soul back out of the earth. Okay? So, notice, she's like, you're, you're, you're a, she doesn't want to say the word. A necromancer. He asks, only of a sort. I love the woman who lies here. In other words, he doesn't say she was my wife, but she's the mother of my child. She would have lived if she had loved another, but she did not. Sabriel's our child. Can you not see the kinship? She looks at him. She looks at the baby. Mm, yeah, okay. <laughs> I think she's kind of going, whatever you say, buddy. <laughs> you know, uh, you walk in the dead. I'm not going to second guess you. She says, I'll come. I'll look after her. And the man says, the charter mage, if you wanted somebody who knows a little bit of the charter, I'll, I'll come help you. And person, perhaps you won't have to. I wonder if your leader will object to two new members joining her band. For my work means I must travel, and there is no part of the kingdom that has not felt the imprint of my feet. No part of the kingdom. Well, the kingdom goes from the wall here to all the way up here. So what you just said, I get around. Okay. Like in the Lord of the Rings, poor Amir in the Council of Elrond said, you know, boy, I traveled a really long way. And Aragorn's like, Psh, really long. It's like here to Woodbury. Buddy, I've been on my feet from here to the Pacific Coast and back you know, many times. Don't talk to me about how far you've traveled. Okay? So... Abhorson says, I am a necromancer, page 11, but not of the common kind. We've got 25 minutes left, and we're not even into the real book yet. Where others of the art raise the dead, I lay them back to rest. Notice, rest. He doesn't say, I send them to hell, you know, where they belong, etc. Those that will not rest, I bind or try to. That is, those that don't stay dead. Zombies. He says, I do what? I try to make them stay dead. Why? It's the right thing. The dead are supposed to stay dead. It's how it works. Living live, dead dead. Never the twain shall meet, so to speak. Okay? I am Abhorson. They're kind of like, oh, okay, if you say so. What does he mean by saying that there? That's what the name means. I help the dead to rest. Rest, peace, relaxation, so to speak. And those dead who won't rest, who won't Requiescat in pacem. Rest in peace. I find them. Okay, they might not be in peace anymore, but they're going to stay dead if his power is strong enough. Okay? So, chapter 1. 
We start off with a rabbit. Why? Well, what do we see happen to the rabbit? It dies, it gets killed, and Sabriel brings it back to life. Okay? What's the purpose of the ab horsing again? The poor little bunny died. Shouldn't it stay dead? What, what happens if you got, you know, wandering mages going around, raising everything back from the dead that have been dead? Well, okay, kind of. What else? You've got the quote-unquote natural order of things doing what? Out of balance. Exactly right. If, if the dead don't stay dead, and the living don't stay living, and you start getting these places switch, there's all kinds of problems. Okay? So, she raises the bunny, page 16. Death and what came after death was no great mystery to Sabriel. She just wished it was. How old is she? Is she 18? Okay. It was her last term, term, term at Wiverly, the last three weeks, in fact. She graduated already. Notice, what kind of classes does she have? Necromancy 1. Advanced Raising from the Dead 3. No. She has English. First in music. Third in mathematics. Seventh in science. So she's really good with words, but, you know, physical equations, she's not so great at. Second in fighting arts. Don't get in a fight with her. And fourth in etiquette. What is etiquette? Manners. She doesn't often do what she's told. She breaks rules. She goes against conventions. Okay? But that's not the only thing on her diploma. Magic only worked in those regions of Anchelsteer close to the wall which marked the border with the Old Kingdom. Riverly College is 40 miles from the wall. Good all-around reputation, and it taught magic to those students who could <coughs> excuse me, obtain special permission from their parents. That is, parents who want to have kids who are magicians, or know the charter somewhat. So, her father obviously does, because, you know, he's Amorson. No other name, just Abhorson. Um, let's skip a bunch again. So she's expecting her father to come to send a sending of himself. And page 19. She's expecting him. And we're told the bottom of that... Paragraph in the middle. It was the first time in her life that he hadn't appeared, and she felt suddenly uneasy. She rarely thought about what life was like in the old kingdom. Okay. Um, skip a couple more pages. Page 21. Previous page, one of the girls... Um, Comes to her, it's been crying, making noise. She talks about seeing something. In page 21, at the end of the first paragraph, or the paragraph at the top of the page, she sees something. She's in the dormitory. These are first-year girls, first form, all around the age of 11. Notice Harry Potter kind of thing. Why? British um, boarding school stories. These began in the mid-19th century with um, Thomas Arnold's, what's the book called? Tom Brown School Day, something like that. Where you have stories, and, and they kind of take off from there, stories of kids who go off to boarding school and their experiences of boarding school. A lot of them, if they're honest, show you, you know, somewhere like Hogwarts would not be such a great place to go. A lot of really nasty, rotten stuff happens in the uh, British boarding school tradition. Anyways, Sabriel sees something. She takes a deep breath, steps into the doorway, fingers crooked in a spell-casting stance. Not quite sure what that means. 
Is she, you know, crooked like this? Like she has, you know, uh, arthritis? You know, lucky spell charm? Um, middle, I don't know, okay? And she feels the presence of death. Locks rarely prevailed against the powers of the old kingdom. The doors open, an intensely dark shape stood there, as if someone had cut a man-shaped figure out of the night, carefully choosing a piece devoid of stars. So what's the man-shaped figure look like, other than man-shaped? Featureless, black, how black? Okay, it's it's like black hole blackness. It's it's like this thing sucks light. It is it's it's a blackness you've never seen before, really. Okay, and so she sees it, no features, but the head turns, so she can see that part. I mean, it's a silhouette, all right, of darkness. It's got a sack and such. Page 22. Sabriel's hands moved in a complicated gesture, drawing the symbols of the charter that intimated sleep, quiet, and rest. She does that to both sides of the dormitory. Why? Puts the kid to sleep. What would happen? 40 kids here. What happens if these 40 kids wake up and see what's there? Why? <laughs> Go back to bed and do what? Head under the cover, under the pillow, you know. Let it not be there, let it not be there, let it not be there. What would this thing be like? Our world. It's not like, you know, somebody breaking in your room at night. Some, you know, if you're a woman or a girl, a rapist or anything like that. It's not like a home invasion. The boogeyman. The boogeyman. That is it. Define the, you can't define the boogeyman. It's just the boogeyman, you know. But a shape with no features, no color, no light, it just moves around. Because it's unknown, that's why there's so much fear attached to it. Okay? So they f all stop screaming, and they go back to sleep. Page 23. It was an old kingdom denizen. That is, it... It belongs there. So if it belongs there, why is it 40 miles on this side of the old wall? What does the old wall separating the old kingdom in Anchostier represent? Yeah, pretty much. It's the, The veil between the living and the dead, kind of, like in the Harry Potter novels. Okay, the separation between magic and not magic, between the real, seemingly, and the unreal. Because most people from Anchester, one, they've never been in Sabriel, excuse me, in the Old Kingdom, and two, they don't believe half of what they've heard about it. Okay. Vaguely humanoid, but more like an ape than a man, and obviously only semi-intelligent. No, But there was more to it than that. Sabriel felt a clutch of fear. She saw the black thread that came from the creature's back and ran into the river. Into what river? Is there a river outside the dormitory? No, where is she now? She's gone into death, so this thing is also in death. And notice it's got a string that attaches it. Why? It's like a kite, essentially. Somebody's flying this thing. Okay? And that kite, the, one, the string goes off into the river. Somewhere beyond the first gate, even further, that umbilical cord, that umbilical rested in the hands of an adept. What does it mean to be adept at something? Really, really good at it. As long as the thread existed, the creature would be total un totally under the control of its master. So what does she need to do? Cut the cord. Okay. 
something tugs at Sabriel's physical body, old Mrs. Miss Greenwood says, what is it? Dead servant, spirit form. Okay, so now you have the dead walking around in the world of the living, bunch of 11-year-old girls. What's the obvious question? Joseph, what did you put for your quiz thing? Why me? Replace the me. Why here? Why now? Just why works. Okay, page 24. Without free will. This thing's being controlled. Something sent it back to the living world. It's controlled from beyond the first gate. Why here? <laughs> Says the magistrix. Why magistrix? Why not magister? Magister is the word from which we get magistrate and its teacher. So why not magister? T-R-I-X is the feminine ending for the word. The E-R is the masculine ending. That's why if you were going to speak linguistically correct, you would say actor, actress. The feminine ending it's the masculine ending. One is not better than the other. One is not beneath the other. Okay. Language does have these linguistic, quote-unquote, gender markers in it. So, why is it here? Notice Sabriel doesn't immediately offer an answer. She shows, well, it's not obviously malign, evil. It hasn't attempted any actual harm. So, hold on. I'll try and talk with it. Hamlet does the same thing with the ghost. When the ghost appears, he says, I'm going to talk to him. Horatio and the others are like, no, 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 don't. It'll try to lead you down. He goes, come hell or high water. I'm going to talk to him. So, Sabriel goes in. She whistles. The thing flinches. Puts its hands to its ears. Page 25. Sabriel breathed a sigh of relief as she saw it slide away. Then gasped as its head broke the surface and it cried out. Sabriel, my messenger, take the sack. The thing controlling the umbilical, dead. Notice, the thing comes out and it doesn't have a flashing neon sign that says, messenger from father. Why not? Where's dad? Read way down there. He's not here at the beginning. He's kind of a little bit beyond the middle. Okay? So, the sack in her hand was heavy, page 26. There was a leaden feeling in her stomach that if the messenger was truly Abhorsens, he himself was unable to return. What's that tell her? Yeah. That meant he was either dead or trapped by something that should have passed beyond the final gate. Okay. So she opens the sack. What she pull out? Two things. The sword and... The bell bandolier, you know, which you kind of wear like this or like this, whichever way you want. And it has how many bells on it? Seven. Seven bells. Okay. Each one is named. Each one is a little bit larger than the next one. Okay. They each have a different tone to them. They each have a different purpose and a different function. Personality. Yeah. Uh, page 28, she goes, um, Father's instruments, the tools of a necromancer, the magistrates, but there are charter marks engraved on the bell and the handle. Necromancy is free magic, not governed by the charter. Father's was different. Ah, so now we're told the charter okay, is not governed. Why not? It just is self-governing. It has its own will. All right. 
Binding, not raising, he was a faithful servant of the church, uh, the magistrate. So you're going to be leaving us, aren't you? In other words, you've got the tools. You've graduated. I just saw it in the reflection of the bell. You were crossing the wall. Yep. Got to go find him. Don't know where he is. Got to go find him. 29. Well, final paragraph. Behind these plans, her thoughts kept jumping back to Abhorson. What could have happened to trap him to death? And what could she really hope to do about it, even if she did get to the old kingdom? How old is she? Again, she's 18. Has she been to the old kingdom? She came from the old kingdom. Okay. Um, she gets to the wall, and she sees all the platoon, the... Um, the young soldiers in the platoon, bottom of 31, where we're told most would have to be conscripts from far to the south. Here she could feel magic potential brewing, lurking in the atmosphere like charged air before a thunderstorm. Wall looks normal enough, like any other medieval remnant. So, in this world, you have a modern world, medieval world, in an ancient world, a classical world, just like we have in our world. Is, is this our world? No. Right? Even though if you look closely at that map of Anchelstier in the Old Kingdom, kind of shaped like what? Close. The wall, the wall here, this is similar to Hadrian's Wall, and this is like, I mean, it's close to Scotland. And everything down below, England. Like the border between that. That area in northern England is called the Borderlands. Okay. The English and the Scots. Not scotch, that's what you drink. The English and the Scots, they've never liked each other. They've never gotten along. Uh, a couple years ago when I was in England, and it was the World Cup, and I think England had already been defeated. No, England hadn't been defeated. Scotland had been defeated. And England was playing Germany. The Scots were all rooting for the Germans. I mean, they hate the English. Okay? Just like the Irish. Irish hate the English and the Welsh. Why? Because England conquered all of them. And they still, okay, we're talking for some of these places, a thousand years ago. You know, and my wife's relatives in South Georgia still refer to the War of Northern Aggression. That's only been 150 years. Right? So, she sees the wall, and what does she notice? That the wall is covered. In charter marks, and they're moving. Kind of matrixy. It's like she's she's seen through the program, right? Clear and cool on this side of the wall, and on the other side, heavy snow right up to it. In fact, I don't know if you saw recently or is it. Big snowstorm went through the uh, Midwest, and I mean, there's a picture taken from an airplane, I think, and you know, there's a line like this, and there's snow here, and no snow here, where you can tell immediately where the squall of snow showers hit. Because, I mean, it's like somebody threw a line just like that. That's how it is here, okay? But this isn't natural looking, apparently. So, she gets off the bus, and she gets surrounded by a bunch of people. She tells them she's from the Old Kingdom. She has papers and such, page 37. Um, how much of this can I skip? Page 38. 
Page 41, an officer says, uh, she's no creature or sending, that is, she's not evil, there's not anything wrong with her, and um, she talks to this officer about her father and asks, page 43, did you know him? He used to visit me twice a year. I, I guess he would have come. He says, yeah, I saw him then. I first met him more than 20 years ago. Strange time, very bad time, bad stuff. She says, you're a necromancer, okay. And he says, when I got here as a young soldier, corpses wouldn't stay buried. So, yeah, all right. Okay, so what do you do about that? You know, it's like they're sitting here. Our, our people or old kingdom creatures, creatures prevented from crossing, would rise up, do more damage than they did when they were alive. So what did you do? He talks about, I met a man sitting on a charter stone, top of the hill to overlook. He was interested in the perimeter. It was, it was Abhorson. He was coming to us. He'd heard about the dead. Why? Because he's a dead fixer. He deals with the dead. And he talks about the wind flutes that he created. Okay. Um, we'll stop there. We're going to have to pick up with around page 46, 47 and get a whole lot further on uh, Monday.